Good evening, everyone. It's Michelle Lee. We're here. We're getting ready to get real on episode two of season two with two amazing songwriters. One from New England area, the New Hampshire area, the wonderful state of New Hampshire, Mr. Rick Lang, as well as a triangle from South Central Pennsylvania. Looking forward to talking with both these gentlemen today. Um, of course, as we uh, remember also a fellow broadcaster, Bob Mitchell, um, who passed away yesterday. Of course, we'll uh, talk a little bit about Bob later on, but uh, we're going to dedicate this uh, episode to uh, Bob and his memory and his legacy in Bluegrass community. So uh, let's get right to it. Let's get real with Troy and Rick. Hi, guys. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Hi Michelle. Hi, Rick. Great to be on the show. Thanks for the invite. Oh, it's my pleasure. And, uh, you know, it's great to have not just one, but two um, Grammy nominated um, songwriters to be on a show like this to get real as we're going to get real with songwriting. Um, of course, some albums that you guys have released, plus who knows what else is going to come up. But I know you guys have lots of stories that you're going to share with us. And I cannot wait for that to take place. And, you know, first and foremost, um, you know, for those who kind of like, know you but don't really know you guys rick let's start with you and your background from the new wonderful state of uh new hampshire yeah um well my most of my life is spent in the lumber business um i gotta have a just finishing up a 50-year career working with sawmills and uh people in the wood industry um and then um about 30 years ago, I took up an interest in songwriting and got very serious and passionate about it. So for the last 30 years or so, I've worked hard to try to develop some sort of skill set of songwriting. And uh, it's just turned into something that's been a love of my life. And he's good at it. Uh. And of course, Troy, you're from uh, South Central Pennsylvania, and um, you're no stranger um, of working with Rick. But how how did you get involved into songwriting specifically? Gosh, you know, I've probably been writing songs since I was ten years old. I remember writing stuff in elementary school, but I'm sure it wasn't very good. Not that I've gotten <laughs> that much better, maybe since then. I don't know, but uh, you know, I was always into writing. You know, even being, you know, I'm also a musician too. So, um, but I always love the lyrics of songs and that kind of thing and how those things were crafted. I just thought that was the coolest thing. So, um, been writing for a long time. Once I started playing the Mark Newton band, that was probably my first time having stuff cut that I wrote, you know, and being in a band. So that was sort of the beginning of all that. So, and playing, you know, Rick Lang, along, well, Rick, Rick Lang songs and local bands that I played with, you know, <laughs> Right. As you guys look at your catalog of songs, um, you guys have written a, several songs together. How did you guys uh, do you can you both like kind of think back to the day you guys first met and then decided, you know what, let's give a co-writing uh, a shot on how many years ago was that? You know, Rick, I mean, you think about it. You, you've been writing for some time. Troy's been writing for some time. But do you remember that first time you two met? I do. Um and it was kind of a life changing for me. In the year 2012, I went to a leadership bluegrass in uh, in Nashville, and I wanted to get more involved in the music business. And at that time, I had never co-written a song with anybody in my life. I had spent 20 or 25 years solo writing. And when I was down there, I decided I should reach out to some people that I knew or knew of to to try co-writing. Troy was one of the First, probably the first person I contacted to ask if he would be willing to write with me. And I hadn't, we didn't know each other well. Uh, and, um, but I know he was a good guy. I know he's a very talented, he's a good writer, great musician and singer. And he welcomed me in. I went to his house and met his family and we sat down and, uh, and it was easy. We just hit it off and we wrote a song um, our first song we wrote together was called Best Laid Plans. And that was a song, a personal song about, you know, Troy's 
sort of about Troy's family and Troy's son. It was kind of built on a, that sto a storyline that was pretty cool. And we finished the song and, um, and we've been writing together ever since. Ironically, the very first song we wrote got cut by Larry Stevenson. That, that was our first cut as first co writers, cut. I think. Our first song get a, was a cut. And yeah. we wrote together for uh, every time I would go to Nashville. And then he moved back to Pennsylvania. And I thought, oh my God, I was in, I was in withdrawal for a while. <laughs> and uh, then one summer, <laughs> family was going out to, to uh, Hershey, PA yeah. to go to Hershey Park. And I saw where he lived like an hour from there. So I left everybody at the park. He didn't want to go to Hershey Park. Is what it was. I didn't want to go to Hershey Park. I couldn't uh, <laughs> I couldn't afford the attendance fee. So, <laughs> so he went and wrote a song instead. Yeah. So my family had a good time there and went there and we, we wrote a song. And then I came back and I said, heck, I'm not going to be going to Hershey, Pennsylvania every year. So we got a hold of Troy and said, man, let's, you want to start remote writing? And we did. And we've written a lot of really, really good songs. Yeah. Getting a response from them. And but you're uh, the only person I've ever remote, you know, done remote writing sessions with. So really, yep. So that, that's a first for me. And it, and I wasn't sure how it would be, how it would go, but it's been awesome. It's been great. Yeah, awesome. Seriously, the good songs. I know some of them are going to be covered at some point or, Troy will record them or I'll record them sometime, but it's yeah. been fun. Troy is such a great guy to write with. Oh, oh yeah. it's a blast. It's an honor getting right with yeah. Rick Lang. It, when I was growing up, you know, Monster River Band, listen to the word of God. I played that in every band I ever played in. Love that song, you know, and now here I am writing with this guy. I mean, this is awesome. Yeah, that was, uh, that was my actually first cut. I got a songwriting cut in my entire life and cut the uh, real Now, break. Troy, of course, you know, um, you guys were kind of like talking, of, talking about remote writing. Um, so that kind of prepared you for the pandemic and writing remotely, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know that we wrote before that, before the pandemic, did we? Remotely? I mean, we, we no, we didn't. We we, uh, we did. started there because I realized if we don't do that, we'll never write together. And right, I do, need, I do need to come up to New Hampshire sometime, though. It would be nice in the summertime, not the winter time. I kept looking out at the street, and Troy never showed up. So I, figured, <laughs> I, should, I should just call him. Yeah, but but that's one thing. I'll, you know, writing in the pandemic has been kind of life changing, and it kind of tested us all to see if we could actually do it. I had my doubts if I had the capability of, you know, remote writing and feeling comfortable and relaxed and writing good songs. I had no idea it would work, but like yeah. it's after a while, it just became natural. Yeah. You sort of forget that screen is there, you know, that there's a window between you kind of, you know, then you just, you just act like you're right in the same room, you know, writing together. It's really cool. Really yeah. true. Rick, Rick's a great so guy. how many songs have you guys co-written together? You know, I would say, you know, at least 15 songs or more. Gosh, it's hard to believe, but I'd say you're right. I know Rick Rick keeps much better track. As, he, as he's found out writing with me, he's like, Troy, uh, have you got that uh, work tape done for me yet? Could you send me those lyrics? Yeah, I was like, yeah, I like writing songs. It's just the uh, doing the homework, you know, it's like school. And Rick's really good at the homework and the writing, too. So well, I'm glad he keeps all that organized. But. Good song. And I have to say, too, Troy stepped up this winter. I've been working on um, building a catalog for a couple of new Christmas albums. And Troy graciously offered to work with me writing some Christmas seasonal songs this winter. Yeah. Our, our first together. So that was uh, that was a fun part of the winter. It was great. And I'll tell you, you know, and I'm a Scrooge. And so I don't want to mess with Christmas stuff before Thanksgiving. And I definitely don't want to after Christmas. So Rick was like right after Christmas, Rick said, Hey, you want to write? And I was like, sure. And he's like, I got some Christmas ideas. I'm like, oh man, I, I don't know about that. <laughs> so we wrote a seasonal song about, should we even say Rick? I mean, we're, yeah, I go ahead. We wrote a song about Jack Frost, which I don't think is something that is a, uh, a typical bluegrass. And it's not really even a typical <laughs> sort of Christmas, uh, bluegrass thing. It's more of just a holiday kind of song. So. Yeah. Jack Frost is back. Yep. Yep. Jack is back, so it's, it's pretty there are very few songs so, written about Jack Frost in the history of songwriting, and I think ours is probably the best. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, I like to think, but <laughs> 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 uh, 
It's always a good time when we get together. Yeah, we're, it's just a great team. Rick has great ideas. Well, you guys, um, I got to talk about one particular one particular song that you guys, uh, Rick, that you wrote and Troy, you sing on. Um, and you released this back up uh, uh, for Father's Day not too long ago called My Daddy's Shoes. Um, so, Rick, tell us a little bit about this song, because this is a song that's really um, you're very passionate about. I mean, as you are for all your songs. But this one, because it's a tribute to um, your dad. Right. Yeah. Um, I had always wanted to write a tribute song about my dad. Um, he passed away at the age of 63, way before his time. And um, I didn't get a lot of chance to spend a lot of time with him later on in his life and uh and he was my hero and i just i tried for years and years and years to write this song and then one summer i was able to put it all together and express what i felt about my dad and reach back at all of the great experiences we had and then i didn't know what to do with a song and troy was you know demoing some of my songs and they're like the best demos ever. And then, then one day I was thinking about the song and hearing Troy's vo voice. And I'm thinking like, God, I'm going to ask him to sing on it. And then it sounded like a record. It wasn't like a song demo. It was, it was like a single. And then, so I asked him, I said, would you mind if I just, we dress it up a little bit and release it as a single for Father's Day so we can have a song to share. And he was cool with it. So we did that. Absolutely. It was an honor to sing it, man. It's a great song, you know, you. as with anything else, if it comes from your heart, you know, you can't go wrong with that. And uh, that's where Rick writes from is from the heart. And that's, that's why I love writing with him. That's why I love Rick in general. I mean, who doesn't, if you, if you've met Rick Lang and you don't like him, it's your problem. <laughs> yep. Well, thank you for the kind words, my friend, but um, I like writing with Definitely. you for the same you Definitely. And uh, yeah, it's right. That's my daddy's shoes right there. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. And you know what? If you read that right. song. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, I was just but getting ready to talk everything about everything in that there. song is true. It really happened. Every bit of it is just taken out of our lives together. So pretty cool. Makes me smile. It, it's definitely a piece of art that is uh, now uh, out there for all to enjoy and know the memory that you have of your father. And and I think, you know, like I said, Troy, you, you did you did a remarkable job with the, the vocals and the whole piece. It, it's a, a great tribute to uh, Walt, um, Rick's father. So both of you, I mean, it's, it, thank you for sharing it with everybody. And and uh, if nobody has heard it, they need to go to, um, of course, all the outlets where they could get the single itself called my daddy's shoes um, with Rick Lang and Troy Engel. Now, Troy, you, um, you know, you talked about writing with Rick and places that you guys have kind of uh, written some songs and, and that where, where do you predominantly find yourself being drawn to when you write, whether you're writing with Rick or other co-writers or solo writing? Right. I don't do a ton of co-writing and I never really did a bunch, you know, just certain people, just sort of like Rick did, you know, some people that you really hit it off with. But I think Rick, Rick and I's thing most of the time goes to songs of faith, whether it's a gospel song or not. It's usually has sort of a gospel-y kind of message. And uh, because that's where, you know, we're just, we're both family guys and uh, we sort of both know that we're very blessed and we've been blessed where we're at in our lives and with our lives. And, uh, sort of where that comes from. So I, I think I tend to dig that, go that direction pretty much every time. And I think we both have uh, or at least story songs, just, you know, just songs about simple in life. And that's, those are the best, just like my daddy's shoes that Rick wrote, you know, it's um, write what you know. And that's, that's sort of where I guess I get just where I go most of the time, unless, and Rick is great about coming up with some really cool ideas that I wouldn't think of. So he'll have a little thought or maybe a verse in a chorus or something and uh, he'll say what do you think of this and and i'll come in and mess it all up <laughs> and then uh, rick's probably like man i've never i don't want to write with that guy anymore he messes all my stuff up but uh it's just it's cool to see where where we can end up you know but i think we draw from the same the same will you know 
Well, and you've, um, Troy, you've worked with um, so many uh, wonderful folks in the business as well as Rick. And but you you were mentored by uh, two amazing um, songwriters in the business uh, who not only are well known in bluegrass, but country as well. Um, the, the late uh, Dixie Hall and uh, Tom T. Hall, two Hall of Famers. Um, tell us your time about, you know, working with them and kind of learning from, I, I want to say, the best storyteller. Yeah, the storyteller, as he's known as. But Rick, Rick probably got, gets tired of hearing. Every time we write, I always say, well, Tom T. says this, or, or <laughs> Dixie would say this, you know. But they, <laughs> they were just a wealth of, you know, little ideas, you know, just hey, don't write this, you know, don't, you know, do it like this, you know, or that kind of thing. They'll have little, little hints. And I'll say that to Rick, well, you know, Tom T says, you know, you know, and that's not, that's not right. That's, there's three songs in that song. You're trying to write three songs. Let's just write one of them, you know, kind of thing. And uh, just these little tidbits that, I mean, it was just an extreme honor to even be at Tom T and Dixie's uh, down at Fox Hollow down there in, in Franklin, Tennessee, but, but to get to write with them. And I was blessed to write 30 songs with them, which is just, just insane. You know, it just, we just had our weekly appointment and I would go down there on Wednesdays usually and drink coffee and we'd write a song in the morning and demo it in the afternoon and mix mistakes. He would try to get it cut before the evening time, but, um, <laughs> and just, you know, just osmosis, just being around them and picking up all the stuff. Well, and, and working with them, I mean, you, you earned yourself the 2005 Spigma um, song of the year with that's Kentucky that was we performed did. by Lorraine Jordan in Carolina road. Yeah. Um, but this also you um, that's how you also got your Grammy nomination with uh, engineering with uh, um, Tom T, the songs yeah. of Fox Hollow. Um, yeah, Eric, how is Eric that? <clears throat> well, that was Eric Brace and Peter Cooper. They they had a plan to go ahead and, and redo the whole Fox Hollow children's album that Tom T had done with a bunch of Americana artists. And it just ended up being a really amazing record. I was the. The, pretty much the head engineer down there for a little while and uh in between when they were sort of in between engineers and um so they wanted to come and record down there at fox hollow and <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> i knew i knew all the gear and that kind of stuff and their engine their main engineer that they wanted to use didn't know all the stuff so i i sort of was there helping out and uh showed up the lay of the land and if anything uh, needed fixing uh i think our first main problem was the air conditioning <laughs> during that record it was pretty hot down there <clears throat> so trying to keep the, the guys cool and uh, keep the session running well but yeah i was blessed to have my name on it as an engineer and you know get a little certificate saying you know uh you know being nominated for a grammy which is a, a, an amazing honor so yeah right right and and rick or you know talk about a grammy nomination uh you you recently uh, mm -hmm. had a good time out in california for your grammy nomination for a gonna sing gonna shout um with billy blue records um how was that experience because you got to experience this just recently and with your entire family yeah i gotta tell you um never in my wildest dreams that i think anything like that would be remotely possible in my life so i'm just a songwriter it has this passion about this hobby of songwriting from New Hampshire. I never thought it would amount to anything. I just do it because I love doing it. And um, but I, I, you know, I'm just very thankful that a lot of the co-writers that I befriended who helped me write songs for that record. Um, that was kind of the key to the album was the really good songs and and uh, getting you know Jerry Sally Oversing producing the record and getting Billy Blue uh, label and Daywind behind promoting it. I mean, here I am releasing records that I <laughs> I don't even sing and play on. They're just my songs. It's kind of an unusual concept, but it worked. And, um, and uh, we just got tons of support, for, including all the radio DJs and radio programmers uh, everywhere supported the heck out of this record, played the heck out of it. Uh, we just got tons of support, and and I'm just very thankful for that. That it led to a an IBMA award, which is my first IBMA award, um, mm -hmm. and then to a Grammy nomination, which is just insanely, you know, I feel so blessed. But then, to be honest with you, what's even cooler than all of that is 
going out to the Grammys with my entire family, my wife, my two daughters, my son-in-law and my granddaughters, and all of us going out there and going to the Grammys together, takes the cake. That's That was the best. Yeah. Enjoying the experience together was just a joy of a lifetime. That's all. Awesome. So I'm just especially when it happened right before the pandemic was officially in lockdown. <laughs> we we made it by that much. <laughs> Even if we were flying back from the LA airport, there were people with masks masks on coming in from overseas, and we didn't think anything about it because we didn't know anything was going on. But then within a month later, the whole world, country, and the world was in chaos, and I realized that we just barely made it through this, and we were so blessed to have that experience, um, you know, before the pandemic, because after that it would have been, it wouldn't be happening. And um, it was just a memory of a lifetime. I'm just, have so many people to thank. And it just, I guess, reinforces my love of the music and passion for the music and makes me want to work hard to keep, keep going at it, you know, so. Well, you know, as you as you guys continue to write, um, has there been someone um, that you still would like to write with? Um, I have this question from a, 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 a Marsha who's uh, tuning in. Um, that is someone that you you know haven't written with and that you would like to write with someday. Well, uh, Troy, we'll go with you first because you know I know you don't co-write much, but there's got to be someone still that you would love to write with. Boy, that's a great question. I mean, it, it sounds more of a bit. I think a lot, some of the guys that I would love to write with aren't aren't with us anymore. But you know, Harley Allen is definitely mm -hmm. one of them. That's one the name that comes up every time Rick and I write. But uh, I don't. Gosh, living right now, I I don't know. I mean, I, I've never even thought about that. You know, I mean, Rick, writing with Rick Lang is honor enough. I mean, he's a brand new winner. I mean, you know, I mean well. well. How about you, Rick? Me? Well, I think that I've, I've ended up writing with a lot of people that I had hoped to write with so far. Um, people that were interested in writing with me. Um, one person I had planned to write with uh, in one of my trips to Nashville was Ronnie Bowman. Uh, because I'm, I'm working on songs for another, pro for another project and we're going to write one together. <laughs> so I had... Two, two songwriting appointments scheduled with Ronnie and some unforeseen thing came up both times that we had to cancel it. And then the pandemic hit and it may never happen, but I was, I hope, hope I could sometime because he writes really good songs. Yeah, I mean, he's one of my faves too. That, he would be on my list. I agree with Rick. He's a really cool cat. But what I will, will say is this, I'm writing with a few people in my, in my circle of co-writers that if it wasn't for the pandemic, I never get to write with. One of them is Josh Schilling with the band Mountain Heart. We've been writing on a regular basis. And if he was out there touring, he would never uh, he would never be available to write with. And he's had time and all of a sudden we've we've been writing some really cool stuff, including some southern gospel type tunes. And uh, so there's been an opportunity to write with some people who are available now because they have more time. Um, you know, singers in some bands who have more time to write. So I get, I don't know, 12 or 15 people that I write to, with on a regular basis. Uh, of course, Troy's at the top of the list well, right there. I'm at the top right now, just so on the screen. That's it. And, but I talk, you know, I mean, we usually write every two or three weeks or so, and it's become a regular thing. And, and uh, someday you're going to hear some of those songs that people are definitely going to cut them there. Yeah really 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 good songs and Rick, rick's given me some good news here lately but you know like miss dixie used to say it ain't final till it's vinyl so we don't talk about these things that's <laughs> true i was thinking it something we have to find for something that rhymes with digital you know uh yeah know. <laughs> but, but but what what yeah, one thing I'm pretty sure of is um i am you know building a uh building my collection of songs for a follow-up to gonna sing gonna shout and uh and um troy and i have written some really good gospel tunes together and um and it's is my hope that we can get one or two of those songs on that next record that would be an honor to have a troy 
Angle co-writer too on that record. That would be awesome. I would be honored. I tell you, I was listening to one today. Uh, we wrote called "The Power of Prayer." Oh my goodness! I mean, I was getting chills and get, <laughs> about to get happy just listening to the uh, my work tape of it. It wasn't my performance. It's just oh, the song. The song was bigger yeah, than the power, power of prayer. Yeah. Oh yeah. We, yeah. We, I mean, it's one of the best ones. We had a couple couple that gave us both goosebumps when we were all done. Yeah. The power of prayer. Troy came up with it, did a work tape version that sounded like a recording, and it was right. just, it, you know, it, it'll stop you in your tracks. It was just yeah. beauty. It was art. And yeah, I, it's bigger than both of us. When you write something that's you, bigger than anything, you, you know, it, it had somebody else's hand on it. It wasn't just ours, you know, holding the pen. So, so yeah. now, now, you guys both don't just write for bluegrass. And Rick, you especially, um, your music has been covered by um artists within southern gospel and jazz and as well as bluegrass is, is there a, a a preferred style of writing that you uh, are passionate about is it more so now these days bluegrass than the others because you have a wide spread of catalogs all over the across the board that's a good question um i just look at it that i write songs period and they all come out different. Um, a lot of people that I write with grew up listening to country music, old time country music, bluegrass and traditional music. I, I grew up in the 50s and 60s listening to soul, soul music, R&B, uh, Motown and rock and roll. And how I ever ended up connecting with bluegrass was quite a surprise, <laughs> surprise to me. You're such the rebel, Rick. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm a late bloomer, I think. That's what they call that. <laughs> well, you're but, making up. You're making up for the yeah, the late part, I think. So it could be. You're but blooming all, well. All, all types of music and like I, the whole jazz thing. Um, I was working on a, a songs for a new Christmas album, and I wasn't that familiar with jazz, and I had Stephen Mojan. Uh, I sent him a couple of my Christmas songs and asked him if he po possibly could demo them because I wanted to pitch some of my Christmas songs. And he got them and he called, calls me back two weeks later and he says, you know, I really like these songs a lot, but you know, I don't know if you're interested, but they could sound really good in a jazz setting. And I thought I was talking with somebody from, from, from another planet. <laughs> I'm thinking, really? <laughs> yeah, I said, I can hear these like, it's with that sound of the 30s, 40s, and 50s classical Christmas songs. So I said, if you think that'll work, that'd be great. So he went and demoed the songs with some jazz cats down in Nashville, and they, they sounded phenomenal. And then we decided, well, if you can do that to those two songs, let's take some, some of the other ones and build a whole, build an album around having sort of some classic traditional sounding Christmas album. And he did it. And it was just a blast. And I, I got introduced to the jazz world and some great jazz uh, musicians and, uh, and singers uh, It made my uh, Christmas album. That's what I love about Christmas, just a joy. Mm -hmm. And it was just a chance thing, but it's a nice diversion. It was just fun, you know? Right, right. Now, Troy, um, when, you had, when you're writing, um, do you, like, just sit down and you start or are you doing something and something pops in your head and then you go with the flow how do you operate as a songwriter um on the whim <laughs> yeah on the whim you know it's really two different ways i mean co-writing is different with rick you know normally he'll have an idea and we'll you know i'll like i say i'll come in and mess with it and really screw it up but um when i'm just writing by myself a lot of times it's just you know, I'll have an idea, you know, you, you hear songwriters always have the radar up and always listen for that next little catchphrase or little something they can steal from somebody else. And uh, so I'll have that thought and that songs happen pretty quick to me. I, I'm not ADHD, but I, it's, it's really got to happen pretty quick. I'm usually, you know, write this thing and get it done in a, <laughs> you know, an hour or two or something like that. I just, um, uh, it comes pretty quick, I guess. I just, uh, I try not to overthink it, you know. Uh, I was going to ask you if there has been a, a song that maybe you've, you haven't finished or you've started and it took you a couple years to finish. Has yeah. that ever happened to you? 
It has. There was one on my, my first album, Southern Skies, called Springtime in Old Tennessee. I had this chorus in my head, and I would walk around singing it for years, and I never had any verses. And we ended up going down 81 once we moved back, visiting Tennessee, and um, all the verses just came to me. So that's one of the rare times that I've never really finished something. Miss Dixie always said, you know, finish the song, whether you like what you the part that you have, if it's missing a verse, if you don't like that verse, but just finish it. Because if you don't, you'll never finish it, which most of the time I'm that way. But that was one of the few times that I, you know, I've sat on something. I think Rick is probably the same way as me. Sometimes you might get such a good idea that you're like, I just really can't write that right now. I just, I know it's so good, but I don't know what to do with it. So you better just let it sit in the stew a little bit, you know? So right. Sometimes where, where has been like the oddest moment of your day or of whatever you were doing that it, a song just came to you like where is somewhere that's like like you wouldn't think it would happen but like you said it just happens oh it could be at any moment anytime i a lot of times in that you know in the in the shower will happen you know most people sing in the shower maybe i sort of write songs in the shower but um you know just you're, it just sort of comes to you but it could be anywhere i mean i'm sure rick's the same way you know you could be at the grocery store and somebody says something you're like oh bam that's a <laughs> that's a killer idea you know so then you're you know the wheels start turning you know that's you know that's when you know you're, you're around your family and your wife sort of looks at you like oh he's got the songwriting <laughs> his switch just <laughs> it flipped okay well uh we'll we'll see you in 20 minutes okay have fun you know <laughs> your eyes glass over they're talking but you can't hear him because you're busy writing something up there you know so uh -huh. how about you rick where's been a place uh something somewhere that is an unusual place or maybe um you know, a, a location or state that you were just uh, just kind of like doing your thing. And then the next thing happened, you got a song that comes into your head. I do remember one time, um, maybe it was 15 or 20 years ago, um, I was headed to work at our lumber company and um, my mind was all on lumber and what I had to do that day. And I'm driving down the road thinking about that. And all of a sudden, this amazing song idea came into my head. And I'm, I'm about half a mile from the lumber yard. And I started thinking about the song more than the lumber yard. And like, I just remember driving past the yard, lumber yard. Like, <laughs> way. I just kept going to the park and ride about a mile up the road. I drove up to the park and ride and sat in, in the park and ride for an hour and worked on the song. Wow. Did they wonder what happened to you because you didn't show up to the lumber yard? Um, they've gotten used to it and they stop wondering. <laughs> they just know. <laughs> if he wasn't the boss, you know, his boss might have a problem with it. But you know. right, I've never been on time in history of my life, so that they they never thought twice about it. But uh, I, quite often, I'll I'll go to do I have a plan and I'm going someplace, and some song will just come into view and I'll have to just change my plan. And uh, and I'm thankful when those things happen. Um, but, you know, Troy's right. It's hard to, you know, you got to capture the inspiration when it's there, if it comes mm -hmm. to you, you have to be inspired. But I find for me, he is trying to come up with really good song ideas that haven't been done before. Uh, I've worked hard at that. I would say like every day early in the morning, because I get up probably four or four thirty. I I I spend like probably an hour um, brainstorming about new song ideas to try to come up, coming up with some new song ideas. If I had some writing appointments ahead that week and I'm and I really want to bring something to the table, I'll actually spend a block of time just thinking and trying to come up with some new new material to consider writing. And um, I find I found that that's kind of essential, especially if you write a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and another thing Tori mentioned, sometimes you come up with an idea and it happens to me way too much that you have a great title or an idea, but you can't do anything with it. Like you'll sit down and nothing will happen. And 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 I look over my song list and I say, that is a great idea, but like I can't I'm not inspired, like nothing's going on. But what I do is when I get together with my co-writers, I'll, I'll take 
two or three that I think I think are really good, but I couldn't get them going. And I'll just send them to them. And if one of them picks one, like let's do that one, they'll take it and get the song started because they it inspired them when I couldn't do anything, and they'll get the song started. So uh, if it wasn't for co-writing, a lot of these ideas for songs I've written in the last few years would just be ideas on a page, no more than that. Right. And and Rick, you know, one of the things that I find amazing and hard to believe that your first co-wrote was with uh, fellow songwriters, uh, Donna Ulysses and Jerry Sally. Um, how is that like when you think about it and where you're at now with your relationship with working with Jerry and Donna on numerous other projects? Um, what 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 has your mind been like thinking since that day that you wrote that first song? Can I tell you the story about how that happened? Of course. Because that was the, the wildest thing. I, I was terrified. I like I almost needed therapy. I was like I had never toured mm -hmm. before. And I went down to the Leadership Bluegrass, uh, to Nashville, to the Leadership Bluegrass program. And and I get there with an afternoon to spare before the plan plan started. And I contacted Donnie Ulysses, who I knew, and asked if she would consider co-writing with me. And I never done, I told her, I never co-written before, but I was like, I know you're really good at it, and would you consider it? So I saw it, and she said, sure. So so I get, so I uh, I didn't even have a car, because the hotel I was staying in was close to where the Leadership Bluegrass class was, so I figured I could walk to it. But then I didn't realize that what Donna was, Donna was her publishing uh, office was was a long walk from there. I hadn't that figured that out. So I get down there and I and I had a handheld GPS and uh, and she gave me an address and I'm trying to find her place and I'm running late and and uh, and and then I realized it was like a mile or two away so I started running. <laughs> I get here. When I'm running and I'm sweating and I'm trying to find the place, and I couldn't find it. And I get there like half an hour late, and I'm totally trashed by then. And I walk to the door and I said, I don't know if this is going to work. Maybe we should just call it off. And then she says, Oh, Rick, by the way, uh, Jerry Sally said he had a songwriting appointment canceled and came in. And was wonder wondering if we could write it, the song together. And I said, Why don't you guys write it together? I I'm good. <laughs> Why don't I just leave? Because I can never write with you two. I mean, I don't know what I could contribute. So they said, no, come on in. I so I hadn't your breath yet. And they were really kind, knowing that I was really panicked over my head and really was struggling. <laughs> and and I sat down with them and they made me feel comfortable. And we ended up writing a song that was on Donner's Christmas album called Morning in Bethlehem Together, which is this great song. I, I might have contributed to like 2% to the song out of the whole 100%, maybe. Don't tell anybody. Well, maybe 1%. I'm not sure. 33 right? and a third. <laughs> but, but when I get done, I realize maybe I could, maybe this is even possible. So that one experience uh, that I was almost traumatized by, was a catalyst in getting, getting, <laughs> realizing it. Co-writing, the benefits of co-writing, I realize really fast. Work with people who are really good at it, who can help you learn, help you grow, and uh, and you can learn from. And that started it all. And never, I never really thought much beyond that one songwriting session. But after all these years, I wrote co-written with a whole bunch of people and Jerry Sally. You know, John and I have written some songs. And Jerry produced my gospel album, and so much has happened. And but that one songwriting session really kind of was the spark that made me think maybe there's something possible here. And and I was ready to walk out so the room. I don't. I can't do this. <laughs> so that extra run gave you that like uh, I'm not sure if I want to do this kind of thing. <laughs> But it, yeah. it's produced a fr 
a lifelong friendship with the two of them and the the work that you've have done in the, uh, the past several years and sounds like a, another um album's about to come out of some of these amazing co-writes and and that and of course you know when you, when you think about <laughs> the stories that um funny stories whether they happen to you as a solo writer or a co-writer i mean it's got to like kind of you know, light the flame for another song out of it. Yeah. Especially when you're hanging <laughs> so out with songwriters. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Everybody, everybody starts yeah, fighting Troy, over good ideas. Of course. <laughs> uh, now, Trey, of course, you, your band um, it, it is been out on the road obviously during the pandemic you guys um like everybody else have been kind of put to a halt and you kind of using the resources of doing multiple different things from co-writing with rick and writing uh solely but you and your family specifically um started doing some singing in the kitchen and your wife uh, definitely does some some amazing cooking tell us yeah. a little bit about this because i know you guys are getting ready to do another one soon yeah we're doing one this weekend but uh we do picking in the kitchen we started it with the band i, I sort of thought of it a couple years ago you know of course it's my two favorite pastimes bluegrass music and eating so <laughs> uh figure out if we could combine both of those amanda is a killer cook and uh you know, you always watch Paula Dean and all these great cooking shows. I'm like, man, you could do that. She's better than those guys anyway. So uh, we started doing it with the band when I started the band. We did three or four. And, uh, of course, with COVID hitting, we were like, well, what do we do? And we're blessed that uh, our, our kids, Troy and Lizzie, uh, are just great musicians. My, my son, Troy, he's 13, and he plays mandolin and guitar and cello. And so he's been playing some great mandolin and singing, and um, Lizzie plays fiddle a little bit, and she's a, a good guitar player too and piano, and uh, sings like a bird. Her, she's got perfect pitch, I think. She's uh, she's uh, going on 15 now, so um, so they're great musicians. So we're blessed to, you know, of course, Mandy, my wife Mandy, plays bass in our band, and so we sort of have our own little mini band here at the house. So we thought, well, I'm going to put these guys to work, <laughs> and uh, so uh, that's what we did. So we we just we have a good time with it. And, sort of sit around and cut up and play a few songs on the show. It's called Picking in the Kitchen with Southern Skies. It's on our YouTube channel. And uh, you know, maybe one of these days it could be on Bluegrass TV. You know, you never know. But uh, <laughs> you just time. never know. <laughs> you just never know. But uh, hint, hint, wink, wink. Yeah. But uh, we, we have a good time eating and picking. <laughs> and I try to keep a little theme like uh, this week. Uh, I've got a new song coming out on uh, February 9th uh, off the new Fox Hollow Memories album called Welcome Aboard. It's going to be the new single. And uh, so we're going to do a uh, sort of a train theme one. We're going to, Mandy's going to cook hobo sacks, which is so the only train food I could think of. So. Yeah, there's the Fox <laughs> Hollow Memories. You, just and, and you guys just uh, recently uh, have done a video for the new single, um, Welcome Aboard, as well, yeah, correct? We did. Yeah, I'm very blessed that uh, I've got a buddy of mine, Brian Lazaro, who is a friend of, uh, of a friend, my, my buddy Mike Thomas, uh, who is a Glen Rock guy, uh, introduced me to Brian. And Brian just so happens is a CMT award-winning video director. He's won uh, like breakout video with Florida Georgia Line and done stuff for Joe Nichols and Pink and... I mean, it's just amazing, but he literally lives, you know, five miles away from me uh, in Railroad, PA, which is pretty funny because the song Welcome Aboard is a train song, a gospel train song I wrote with Tom T. and Dixie. And uh, so uh, he ended up having some footage. We have this great steam engine um, called Steam Into History. It's the Northern Central Railway. And uh, actually, yeah, down there at the bottom with me playing the mantle, I'm in front of the caboose, but um, bring it up the rear as usual. But uh so he had some great footage from the train and I said, Hey, let's, let's go, you know, would you mind cutting it? I'm, he's, he's agreed to, to work on a bluegrass budget, which I don't know why, but he's, he's a really nice guy and I appreciate him doing some charity work. And uh, so we, uh, we cut that a few weeks back and he's like, Oh man, it's supposed to be pretty nice that day. So let's, let's film something. And we went over there and it was overcast. The wind was blowing and it was 30 degrees and, you know, we about froze, but um you know, he, he did as good as he could do with his subject matter, which is me. So uh, he, uh, he has to put up with that. But his he, he just does an amazing job. And I'm blessed to have him on that. Uh, uh, doing. He also did our Haunting Me video that was out, too, as well. So uh, 
blessed to have have him do both of those. They look amazing. So. Wow. Well, it, it it's great to see uh, this pandemic is definitely not keeping folks down. I mean, you guys are all being very creative um, in different aspects of what you do in the bluegrass community. And of course, you know, we all had an opportunity to gather um, in 2019 to be part of the songwriter showcases um, at IBMA. And thanks to Rick for asking me to MC and gave me a chance to, uh, to introduce you and hear your band, um, you know, and it was like, I gotta be honest. And I even told you that night when you started playing some of the songs, I did not realize how many songs you have written that other people have recorded, Troy. I mean, yeah. it is just amazing yeah. um, how much, you know, not only as you as an artist, but what you do as a songwriter for others in the community. And, and Rick, you know, tell us a little bit about um, the songwriting committee, because I know you're you're huge um, with making sure that is, you know, going strong, especially uh, with the virtual IBMA this past year. And hopefully we'll all be back in person in this coming year. Um, but how does, you know, how do you kind of like, you know, rally the troops, rally the songwriters up for what you guys do throughout the year? Right? Well, it's certainly more in interesting now in this day and age. Um, I think the key is you have to have people on the committee who have a deep love and passion for the music, whose hearts in it, and who want to contribute, um, help the cause of the songwriter. Um, I think um, right last year was a big challenge having a um, uh, you know having a virtual world of bluegrass because we were kind of limited to the type of events that we could pull off virtually as opposed to in person. Mm -hmm. and I think the year before we had uh, 11 or 12 songwriter, uh, songwriter centric events at the world of bluegrass, but we picked out some things that we, we felt uh, people would enjoy and get value from. And, and I, we had to find somebody to lead each event and, or host it. Uh, and, um, in a virtual setting there, but we we just all brainstorm, try to come up with good ideas, um, try to make it entertaining. Um, it's a lot of fun because we we have a chance to to showcase other songwriters and um, and I think um, I think this last time we did a we did some song circles and we did you know the songwriter showcase that. Uh, um, I think that Mike Mitchell uh, and, and Jennifer Brick uh, uh, pulled off the, uh, some great video footage of uh, of the con contestants for that. That was pretty cool. Um, but we put a lot of work into it. I mean, like every year, I think in March we start in March brainstorming for a world of bluegrass in the fall, and it really usually takes about half half a year to put something together. To get to decide on the, the events we're going to have, um, to get um, to get a panel together, uh, to coordinate it with the with the powers to be at the IBMA. Um, so it takes it really takes time, and uh, but it's a lot of fun. I think um, it, it's amazing the songwriter constituency at the IBMA has just grown in leaps and bounds. I mean there's just more and more songwriters than ever, even in bands. Like there's hardly any bluegrass band and bluegrass music that doesn't have one or two songwriters in the band. Yep. And that wasn't the case right. for a long time. I think we're in the yeah. heyday of that. I think it's an awesome thing. It's, it's phenomenal. And that's why we're hearing uh, just this uh, amazing burst in new songs coming out all the time. Um, original material everywhere you turn. It's very healthy for the music and uh, we're doing what we can on the songwriter committee to help support it, to help, uh, um, to help support songwriters. And uh, I should mention too, we, we started two or three years ago putting out the songwriter newsletter, uh, mm -hmm. which Troy has contributed to yeah. uh, among others. And 
So we send it out every six weeks or so, and it's a, a newsletter geared towards a songwriter. It'll have articles about songwriting or songwriter related topics, um, information. Uh, some of them are in, in, in are written, uh, you know, written articles. Some are videos because uh, Troy did this killer vi video on demoing songs because he's a master at demoing songs. And yeah. um, I'm the best. Wait, 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 wait. One, of, one of the key things um, I think a lot of people who maybe are consider um, be becoming songwriters or diving in and writing some music, um, I think some folks kind of wonder, like, how do you 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 two individually um decided to you know um do your licensing and publishing because i mean obviously those are ch those are key things for a songwriter to have um um do you self-publish or, or are you guys not self-published how do you guys actually do that um troy well you know why don't you take this one first sure uh, i do my own publishing i mean I I also have a demo service like uh, Rick was talking about, I do bluegrass demos, and I have, always have clients say, well, how, you know, what do you recommend? Do you have a, you have a publishing or should I get my own publishing company? And, um, you know, and, and the thing is, even record labels sometimes don't know. You know, I've had record labels say, well, if you don't have a publishing company, then you yeah, we'll keep your publishing. Well, no. I, I can get excess writer clearance. I can actually keep both sides if I want to. But, you um, so I, I do have my own publishing company, but you know, you know, when you write, you know, then it becomes different, different things and your you know, different splits and things like that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, you know, I don't have any exclusive thing. I, I learned a lot of, a lot more about that probably than some people know through doing TV music and TV publishing and doing music for TV shows, because that, you know, that is a whole real industry, you know, of, of right. publishing companies and every, every company you deal with is a different publishing company. So, um, but it's good to, to be well versed in that, you know, because, you know, we all know you're not going to make millions of dollars, especially in the bluegrass world, but, you know, at least get credit and at least, you know, at least get that, you know, $15 that you deserve, you know, for at least, at least a little something back. And uh, it's nice to see that I think some labels have, have uh, come along and, and realized that the songwriter is as important, you know, I, um, so I, I think that's a good thing. How about you, Rick? You had your own publishing company, I know. Yeah, I started it about 20 years ago. It's uh, Haley Inner Music. And that's uh, the, the name of my publishing company is named after uh, one of my nieces who lives in Florida, whose name is Haley Anna. And um, so I was, um, I just feel if you, if you set up your own publishing company, you have control over your songs and you have ownership of your songs. Mm -hmm. and have control over what happens to your songs um and i and i just i was uh i asked advice from some songwriters i knew back when i get involved with bluegrass about publishing and they suggested you really should you'd benefit by doing your own publishing and even though there's paperwork and there's you know there's a lot of record keeping involved in it um I just think, you know, you own your, you, you own your song catalog. I would say that probably two thirds of the co-writers that I work with have their own publishing. Okay. So publish. So when you get a song cut or recorded, you'll see, you know, two or three publishing entities on there. And just, uh, just there's a lot of benefits from that. And I agree with yeah. Troy. It's a good thing to do. If, if you like it. It's not hard to do it all. If you, you know, you can get it, you just get with the performance rights organizations, you know, either ASCAP or uh, BMI or CSAC or one of those, but I'm, I'm with BMI. I don't know, who are you with, Rick? Are you with BMI? BMI. Yeah. Uh, and I think, what was it, $100 or $200 to start your own publishing company? I mean, it, it's a little investment, but it's something that you'll keep, you know, like Rick right. said, for, he's had his for 20 years. I've had mine for probably 15 or so or something like that. So once you have it, it's a, it's a once and done kind of thing. And, uh, it's really not that complex and they're there to help you. Yeah. So, yeah, and and the thing is, is, it's like, you know, like you said, you, you have that full ownership of your catalog there. And of course, in, in these times, um, obviously, you know, it was 
I know this is going to go bad. You had cassettes and you had the vinyl and then you went to compact discs and now we have the digital world and vinyl's coming back. It's how do you, um, as a songwriter and owning your own publishing company, kind of keep the the royalties in, intact because you have digital sales, you have physical sales. Um, how does that work for you guys because you are your own We'll just say your own bosses in that in that aspect. Right, right. I think the PR, PROs take care of it for you pretty much. I mean, pretty much, yeah. As far as performance, you know, as far as getting played on the radio or things like that. Then you have the mechanical royalty side, you know, which is mm -hmm. you know a band decides to record it, and they either they're, you know if they're on a record label, then they print up a thousand CDs, and they need to pay you, you know, the statutory rate, which is what nine cents a, a song for every you know CD and uh, I will say, uh, classically, blue, bluegrass and bluegrass artists have been pretty <laughs> way behind on mechanicals. So even on stuff that you know, I've written with Tom T and Dixie that I know, you know, I'll still get a check from the Harry Fox agency for like twenty cents. I'm like, that's not possible. <laughs> you know, somebody only made four CDs or five CDs. I know that's just not. You know, I don't worry about the money as far as Tom T and Dixie. They they were so good to us, but you know, you know, some of these labels and artists, you know, and, and there are artists that have been great, just like uh, Larry Stevenson. He's, he's one of the best, you know, with best laid plans, you know, he, he pays you to the dime. He knows, you know, whatever he owes you, he pays you, you know, and some labels and artists are really good for that. Absolutely. And, so, and, and so it's not, uh, it's, it's not negligence really, or not intended, you know, they don't want to, they're not trying to keep you, from, you know, keep from paying you. They just don't know that they need to do it, you know, and that's, um, so try to, and that's part of the songwriting committee, you know, the more um, the whole industry knows about songwriting, the better off it's going to be, whether they're songwriters or not, you know, they, uh, I feel like we're getting a little more respect than we, than we have in the past, you know, because, you know, it's funny, a lot of fans still think that the artist who sings it wrote it, you know, they think just because you know, third time out is singing a song, Russell Moore wrote that song, not necessarily, you know, or, mm -hmm. or you know, that, that kind of thing. So I think it, it's a whole world that people don't even know exist, you know? Right. And, and, and speaking of songs and Rick, one um, is going to be, uh, well, it's his latest single, Alan Bybee's latest single, Blue Collar um, Blues, um, that you wrote. Um, is coming up on his uh, new album with Billy Blue Records. Uh, tomorrow it officially is released, the whole Hitchhiking to California. Um, that's going to be... Uh, some great f fields as artists are continuously working hard during this pandemic and recording singles and and his latest single now being a song that you had wrote. Yeah, um, I'm very thankful for uh, that uh, Alan and his band cut that song. Um, <clears throat> I have to write uh, well, write with Jerry Sally a few times. When we did the Gonna Sing, Gonna Shout record, we wrote for a few days for that particular album. But then we got together a couple other times and wrote just songs. And I remember I met him in his, Jerry at his house one day, and I've had this idea for the song for years called Blue Collar Blues. And the whole and the song is about a blue collar construction worker who's struggling with, her, with that really hard way of life where you're underpaid, overworked, uh, you don't seem like you're getting anywhere, and it's uh, pretty tough sledding. And um, so I wanted to write a song to pay tribute to the blue collar worker, of which um, I was one back in my 20s. I was a construction worker for many, many years. And, um, and Jerry was up for writing the song, and it, uh, I think we pretty well nailed it telling the story. Uh, and... Uh, about a uh, you know blue collar worker and uh, I didn't know if anybody was going to cut it, but I was thankful Alan did and did a great job and um, I think folks will like it. It's a it's it's real. It's like uh, as real as it gets. And uh, so I'm um, mm -hmm. very thankful. And any anytime any artist uh, chooses one of your songs to record, it's quite an honor. Because uh, and actually, he, that's gonna be that was gonna be my next question. Has there been an artist that kind of um, for you, Rick, that kind of stands out who has recorded a song that you would never thought would record one of your songs? I don't know. Um, 
I never really thought about it. Well, my my first my first cut uh, by the Lonesome River Band, "Listen to the Word of God." I never thought that song would ever get recorded by anybody in the history of music. So, um, but that's a bluegrass standard. Yeah, absolutely. So, actually, that first cut was one I never thought I never thought I would get a bluegrass cut in my lifetime, and I never thought anybody would cut that song. But I caught the break of a lifetime. Um, I was like, I was in my, I was, or it was early in my songwriting days and I, I was writing a lot of really bad songs and I wouldn't say they're bad. They just weren't good. <laughs> I'm safe to say. Yeah, that's a nice way of putting it. Yeah. But, but I like, I like the bluegrass. I like the blues element in bluegrass gospel music. Bill, Bill, Bill Monroe did a lot of that, uh, with his songs. And I wrote this, wrote this song one time. And I uh, remember sending a cassette tape to the Lonesome River Band, and I had never met most of the people I sent songs to. They didn't know me from Adam, and I'm sure most of them get thrown in the recycle bin. Didn't take them out of the package or anything. They just probably just didn't even listen to them. But uh, but I wanted to try, and and um, I thought nothing would ever happen to it. But this actually is a true story. I was uh, I was I went to an Allison Krauss concert in uh, Central New Hampshire one time, and my wife and I are sitting there watching the show. And I went to go to the restroom, and I noticed that in the back wall, Dan Tominski was stance was there. This was before he was in the band, but he showed up to be a guest on the at the show. They asked him if he would come to the show, and he could do a few songs with them. So he was standing against the back wall. And I walked by him and I said hi. And he says, Rick, Rick, have you, have you got a, any chance you could send me another cassette copy of Listen to the Word of God? And I almost fell on the floor. <laughs> and he said, he said, Tim and I listened to it and really liked it, but he lost the cassette tape, so we weren't going to record it. But okay. but if you, if you could send us another tape, we were interested in recording the song. That actually happened. So I on the song. They did this phenomenal track, uh, and uh, was my first song cut on, and the album ended up being album of the year. And like that's like, you know, that's like the break of a lifetime. So I'm very grateful for that. And it's the Rick Lang touch, huh? It's the Rick Lang touch. It all turns to gold. So. No, it's just like who who go figure how that could actually happen, just the circum life circumstance. But uh and I was playing and I was I wasn't a very good musician and I was playing mandolin on the track and I'm playing these like simple little turnarounds that a child could play and, and they almost played it like that on the record. I'm thinking like <laughs> no way they were playing what I was playing when I sent it to them. But um but it was it was really rewarding <laughs> to, it, it kind of inspired me that maybe i can do this and i'll keep working at it and uh because i had always heard before i get a song cut you have to write a hundred bad songs before you're going to write a good one i think that's been written in songwriting mm -hmm. books well i wrote my first hundred bad songs and started on the second hundred bad songs <laughs> number 101 yeah before i started writing good ones but, I kept at it and you know improved over time and but the co the co-writing with people uh and uh, and learning from my co-writers has really been the thing that's helped me the most over the years including troy i learned from troy right right we learned from from tom t and dixie hall I, i'm absorbing that some of that through him when i write with him some yeah. of that wisdom yeah that's awesome well, and I think that's that's like a key thing is absorbing from each other. And, you know, you guys have mentioned uh, about, you know, when people hear a song, they, you know, they usually feel like the musician who's singing it and and performing is the songwriter, not uh, not necessarily the case. And, you know, the songs all begin with the songwriter and a pen and a paper and a, an idea. And you guys definitely make it all seem so easy um with the songs that you have written through your career what is one as we uh, get ready to wrap things 
things up. Um, what is one thing as songwriters that you could, you know, pull out of your your hat of tricks that an advice that you could give someone who's aspiring to be a songwriter um, that they could take from, you know, tuning in and hearing what you had to say, Troy? We'll go with you Gosh, first. I would say just listen to as much stuff as you can, you know, uh, latch on to that stuff that that you love the most. You know, for me, it was probably growing up listening to Randy Travis records and listen, you know, just picking apart every line, you know, looking at the, the liner notes and um, just reading those lyrics and uh, just seeing how things are put together, you know, keeping your mind open. Um, I hear people all, all the time. I see people go, man, I just don't know what to write about. And I know Tom T was not one of those guys. He would just take off on these trips on songwriting trips where he would just get stories. And that's where he got his stuff. You know, he, he'd just go sit in a, in a diner somewhere and just, and watch people, you know? Um, so that's the thing. Just keep your antenna mm -hmm. open, you know? And I think at the same time your antenna is open, you have to keep your filter on too, you know, cause you, and I do the same thing too. You know, you, you go, Oh, that's an awesome idea. And then two seconds later, Oh, and then once, you know, somebody can say I had eggs for breakfast and you go, Oh my gosh, that's a great song. And, you know, you, you have to be able to say, well, yeah, I don't, I don't know how good that, you know, how good that's going to be, you know, <laughs> but I think just keeping your ears right. open, do, doing as much research, trying to read things that you, um, I'm not a huge reader, but uh, you know, try to, you know, even reading whatever kind of novels or books or something that uh, might open your mind and, uh, you know, try I, And like Rick said before, I think it's important to be different. So um, you, you also have to know where everybody's already been. Yeah. So you don't go there kind of thing too. So you sort of have to um, have a, a finger on the pulse of uh, what's already been written, you know, and try to avoid that or find a new way to, you know, like Rick and I always talk about doing gospel songs. Every every gospel message has been written about, you know, thousands of mm -hmm. times and trying to come up with a new gospel song, you know. But there are. There's just new. You just have to find your perspective, I think, is, 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 the, is the whole thing. Find your take on, on something new. So, How about you, Rick? What kind of advice you could give to future writers? Well, I think for me, I didn't discover this early on, but if you, if you write from your own personal experiences, if you write what you know, I mean, I, I started out writing songs because I was listening to Flat and Scruggs when I was discovered bluegrass. And I'm thinking like, oh, I should write a song about a cabin and a hill too, because they did it. Like I never lived in a cabin and a hill. So I'm writing these songs that really didn't make you feel anything. And mm -hmm. after a few years, I realized you have to write what you know, what your own experiences are. I live near the ocean, so I don't live I don't live up in hills. So I started writing songs uh, about my surroundings, about the ocean, and experiences near the ocean. And I said, so I started writing what I knew, writing from personal experiences, just writing from something deep inside. Write what you feel, feel what you write. Uh, and I think just that alone, uh, just just look around, write about your own world. Because when you write, you could write a song about something that somebody else had already written about, but through your eyes and from your own heart, it's going to come out different because it's you. Yeah. God made us all different. And I think just be who you are, you know? And, uh, yeah. and just, it that's how I feel. numerous songs that you both have wrote together and as individuals um they have touched not only my heart but uh you know others um not only in the bluegrass community but all genres of music um that's why they fall in love with you guys as songwriters and what you do and your your collaborations together just uh you know just making that mark um and allowing artists um other artists to take what you've written and just pass it on to others to enjoy. And I, that's one of the, the privileges I have in radio, you know, being able to be that that outlet for your music from the artist at the um, moment. And you know, we, we cannot thank you guys enough what you guys do, um, putting that pen to paper and, you know, in Troy's case, putting it to the demo, to, you know, to record it yourself or send it off to other artists to record. But, uh, 
you know, it's always great fun. And I just want to remind folks um, of Troy, um, Troy's uh, latest album. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, is Fox Hello Memories um, songs. Um, beautiful, beautiful album um, of all the songs that you've written with, uh, not all, but most of them yeah. that you've written with uh, Dixie and Tom T. And I will tell you my personal favorite, of course, is Mama, What Does Heaven Look Like? Um, and that that is just one of the, the special songs off that album. And of course, Rick, your Grammy um, nominated and your IBMA album um, song of Gonna Sing, Gonna Shout won you that IBMA award with Claire Lynch on vocals. And uh, you got you that Grammy nomination. Um, so, you know, thank you so much for uh, um, uh, on the Thursday. The weather um, stays uh, less frigid as they're calling it, calling for it in both in all our areas this weekend. Mm -hmm. So I hope yeah. you guys all stay safe. Uh, but I want to, um, before we uh, officially go, um, we want to remember uh, a great fellow radio broadcaster in the bluegrass community, Bob, Bob Mitchell. Um, before, I believe it was before the holidays, he went in for surgery and unfortunately um, passed away yesterday due to uh, uh, COVID-19. Um, so one of the key things is, you know, his, his style of broadcasting, you know, made a huge impact in the bluegrass community nominated um for multiple spigma awards for dj of the year as well as um ibma broadcaster of the year um in the years and he he, he will always be remembered for entertaining the wonderful folks everywhere and across the world um and that's in i just um you know when you hear of someone passing um it's always you know, devastating. But when it's this pandemic, the reason why we're all in the lockdown, that just reminds us you need to be cautious, be safe. And, you know, we will get through this. Um, but we will remember Bob Mitchell and what he has done for the bluegrass community um, in the years to come, because he was such a a remarkable man with what he's done in radio and his uh, his programming. And I know he's uh, had the opportunity to talk with Troy on numerous occasions. And uh, of course, you know, Rick, he played your tunes. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, he's a great guy. <laughs> but uh, he certainly made the best thing you can do in this life is take your God given talents and do something to make the world a better place. And he sure did that. Yes, he did. Yeah. And he's one of those guys you won't hear a bad word spoken about. Yeah. Yep. Mm -mm. That is for sure. Well, I want to say thank you again, Troy Angle. Of course, um, visit TroyAngle.com uh, for his latest uh, details of his um, album. Again, um, the songs I wrote with Tom, uh, Dixie and Tom T, um, Fox Hello Memories, and Gonna Sing, Gonna Shout from Rick Lang and Billy Blue Records. I'm looking forward to seeing more things coming from you, your pen, both of your pens uh, together and solely. Um, congratulations, Rick, on the latest single with Alan Bobby being released. And, uh, you know, Welcome Aboard is the next single for Troy. Um, cannot wait to see the video. I know that's going to be um, out soon um, yeah, in the next uh, maybe hours, a few hours. Or, hours maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wait. So I, I thank you guys for uh, being part of the show. And, you know, it's always enlightening to hear from, like I said, you know, the artists are artists and songwriters are artists too, but just in a different way with a pen and a paper. And it goes a long way and it touches so many hearts and so many people in the world. So thank you for your talents. And I invite you all to join me um, in two weeks uh, where uh, we will have Episode three of season two, our special guests are going to be Dan Eubanks of Special Consensus and Daryl Nicholson of Bossom Range. Um, that will be February 11th uh, right here as we get real. Um, I th thank you guys again so much for your time. Everybody, hope you join me tomorrow uh, morning, seven to noon with the Smoke Country Jam on WOBL. Um, you can catch it online at WOBLradio.com as well as from our free mobile app. And of course, the Bluegrass Borderline Sundays afternoon at noon right there on WOBL. And thanks again for everybody allowing me to get real. 
Kenneth, Troy, and Rick here on Real Talk Bluegrass. Thanks for Sammy Passamano behind the scenes, keeping us on and going strong with Bluegrass Music TV. Check out Bluegrass Music TV Prime. You get your opportunity to subscribe free for the next few days. And just for $4.95, you can catch amazing, great shows, Bluegrass Music Prime as well. Take care, everybody. Until next time, I'm Michelle Lee. I thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah.